All right, good evening everybody. Welcome to our development committee, 4th of June 2019. Before we get started properly, just to our usual emergency evacuation announcement. <coughs> Should we be required to evacuate the building, would you please leave the building via the nearest available exit to the chamber? Our assembly point will be in the public car park at the side of the Civic Suite. Please don't delay your evacuation by collecting any belongings. Please don't return into the building until given permission to do so by council staff. Please also note that the meeting is being audio recorded and if you've got your mobile with you, please turn it off or to silent. Thank you. Just before we, we do start, there is a, an addendum. Can I check that you've all seen it, got it, digested it? Yeah. All right, I won't mention it again. I'll take it as read that you've digested the contents. Thank you. Right, apologies for absence. They've been received from Councillor Merrick uh, and his substitute is Councillor Cutmore. Our non-members attending this evening are Councillors Rowe, Pavelin, Miss Mason, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Hum Hudson and Councillor Lumley. Okay, minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of March 2019. Be happy for me to sign those later as a true and accurate record of that meeting. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Go to the hands. Councillor Stanley first. <coughs> you better do the microphone, please, just for the record. Uh, non procuring interest on the uh, 190894 as a member of the Town Council. Thank you. <coughs> Reeves. Uh, two non pecuniary interest the um, 18 slash 00448. Uh, the architect involved there is someone who I know through my business, although I have had no uh, dealings with him over this site, no conversations at all. I've just come across him in the lines of my business. And also on uh, the land rear of 37 to 39 Downhill Road, 18 slash 01064, uh, I have a non-pecuniary interest through the applicant, one of the applicants uh, attends one of the support groups that my, my wife runs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mrs Mason. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got an other pecuniary interest in item 72. Thank you. Councillor uh, Steptoe. Non pecuniary interest as a member of the Barling Bagner Parish Council with regards to item 73. Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chairman. Non pecuniary interest in item 6 on the grounds I'm a town councillor. However, I can confirm that I didn't attend that planning meeting where that was discussed. Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Bagner. Non pecuniary interests, uh, Raytown Council, and okay. the same items. Mr. Wilson. Williams. 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 Sorry. What was that? <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> um, non pecuniary interest in item 7.3 being a ward council for the area. Okay. Thank you. Any more? Right. Thank you very much, then. Okay. Item 6, which is. Uh, Rayleigh High Street, installation of a rapid electric vehicle charging point. <coughs> Members, the application site forms part of the highway um, in the High Street in Rayleigh Town Centre. If you can go to the photo one, please. So the proposed charging point is to be located between um, this lamppost and this uh, thin uh, black pole that mounts the parking restriction sign. Um, the charging point will be located close to the kerb, um, approximately um, le well, less than 0.5 metres um, set back. If I can take you just to the next image. As Thank you. This is an image of the charging point that's proposed. It's uh, 1.8 metres in height, uh, 0.94 metres in width, um, and 0.41 metres in depth. The application stems um, from grant funding that the council has received from the, for the installation of electric charging points in the district um, to address air quality issues associated specifically with the A127. Locations have been located 
um, in Rayleigh and Rochford, and all but this charging point is permitted development, not requiring permission by application to the local authority. This charging point requires planning permission because it's located within the highway, and that's one of the stipulations that excludes it um, from um, permitted development criteria. Although the proposed location in Rayleigh High Street is in the conservation area, it's not adjacent to a building of particular merit. If we go back to the um, image two, please. So it's, it's in front of, um, of these buildings here, um, sort of 60s, 70s, not of particular design merit, um, whereas there are some sort of listed buildings in the conservation area on the high street. The intention is for the rapid charger, um, which charges at, at average, the average car to 80% charged in 30 minutes, allowing for use of these bays in the high street location, which would remain um, restricted in terms of the amount of time that a car could park there. The proposal would support the council's aim to improve air quality in the town centre, which is designated an air quality management area. On this basis, Chairman, the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions as recommended. Thank you. The speaker on this one, Councillor Mercer. Thank you, members. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Bailey Town Council. Um, as a town council, we understand the need for the use of electricity powered vehicles and for those vehicles to need charging points in order to have cleaner air for our residents to breathe and a cleaner environment in the future. The planning committee discussed this issue at length and concluded that these charging points should be off street and be available in our many car parks, the ideal siting for them. The site of this proposed installation is on our high street in our dwindling conservation area. Bit by bit, it is being eroded by the allowance of ultra-modern builds on the borders and internally illuminated signage, something that is contrary to RDC's own planning policy. The fact that this point is wrapped in holsters in a black colour does not mean that it will blend in. It will stick out like a proverbial sore thumb. The allowance of this particular charging point would mean the relocation or removal of one of the town council's benches, something still to be discussed after a planning application has been submitted. We objected to this plan on the grounds of a loss of public parking in the high street. Shoppers will lose that free hour available to them at the moment, detrimental to the local economy and business. Market traders will be affected as we have planning permission to use the pavement for weekly markets and events. Highway safety, traffic generation and not in keeping with our fragile conservation area are other points. Even Essex County Council, a historic buildings and conservation area officer stated that considering the location and size of the feature, I consider this proposal will cause harm to the character and appearance of the conservation area. If this goes ahead, how many more will we end up with in the high street? The officer's report did not list all the points we made and excluded our points on safety and, and the conservation area. What will happen if someone leaves their vehicle to charge when we are holding an event? We have already had cause for concern on a couple of occasions when vehicles have been left in the high street on days we've held the Trinity Fair, the Christmas lights, and we also had a vehicle near to the service on Remembrance Sunday, despite warning signs requesting not to. Unfortunately, it is a sign of the times that vehicles left are a cause for grave concern and a worrying time. Allowing this particular charging point at this location is unacceptable and will cause obstruction to our own planned events. How will the charging be monitored? Someone may be able to park there for free on the pretense of charging their vehicle. Parking enforcement is irregular and, and would miss this frequently. We also felt that these points would be used by members of the public from outside Rayleigh as many of our own residents with electric vehicles already have charging points at home. Due to the lack of these points in surrounding areas, this has the potential of generating more traffic in the high street and a potential for queuing to use it, causing an obstruction on the highway. I urge councillors to vote against this proposal on the grounds of it not being in keeping with the conservation area and that, as the town council has already planned planning permission for the high street, that it is detrimental and contradictory to this. There are better locations and these should be used instead of our high street. For our visiting speakers, Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I agree with everything that Councillor Mercer has just said, uh, with the exception of the last paragraph, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, I was one of the councillors that actually signed the letter um, to apply for this grant funding, and I'm very proud that Rochford District Council has received it. However, I think we're missing the point here. I think to have a monstrosity like that in the high street is an insult to <coughs> all councillors and the residents of Rayleigh, and I cannot support it, or will not support it. Um, I just think officers really need to go back and look at this um, and perhaps look at a site in the car park because at the end of the day this is where these charging points belong in car parks I've seen many in different towns that are all in car parks and they're, they're quite smart but this is a massive piece of equipment here and I just think it's unacceptable to be in a conservation area in our high street um, what I would like to see tonight chairman is this go back to our officers um, it's deferred and goes back to our officers and they come back with some with a better place to put this. Um, I'd also like to refer to 2.2 on page 6.2, whereby it says um, a number will be installed per, um, as permitted development. I think that's very naive too, because quite frankly, um, I think all these kind of things should come into to planning for us all to, to discuss. Um, so again, I think we need to actually bring those into planning. Um, and again, I really, really don't have a problem with these um, charging points. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have signed the letter uh, for the funding. And as I've said earlier, I'm very proud that we've got that funding. But we just need to be sure where we put these these um, vehicle points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sir Wilkinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm here as the ward councillor for this uh, particular area where this is to, to be situated. Um, and there's a couple of issues I'd like to make. I agree with the comments that have been made by the two previous speakers. Um, I've canvassed a number of residents within the ward, uh, admittedly only my ward, and I do accept that the high street affects all five wards within the town. And there's mixed views. I think everybody agrees the importance of uh, moving ahead with electrical charging vehicles um, and doing what we can to improve air quality. Um, that seems to be across the board. But it's, uh, there's quite a split when it comes to the location and I think it's the location which is obviously what we're talking about tonight we're not talking about them, them in principle I think we all probably all agree that in principle this is a good idea but it's the location which is the reason why this is here as Councillor Rowe has already said a number of these well in fact the vast majority of these are subject to permitted development when you look at the the location of these what I would ask is and there's no mention of this and it may well be something that's been considered by officers but it's not been mentioned we have four main car parks in Rayleigh um, and as Councillor Rowe said why are they not being put in there or are they being put in there um, so if that is the case then why does this need to be done in addition to that um, I don't see why that needs to be done um, the second point I'd make is that whilst the high street at Ray in Rayleigh is currently subject to an AQMA uh, or is an AQMA and subject to an action plan um, and I think it's right that we do everything that we can as a council to try and improve the air quality in the town um, in doing something that's going to encourage more traffic within the high street is certainly not going in that direction I would suggest Secondly, um, looking long term, I don't know if it's, and I am looking long term, um, whether or not any considerations have been given to possibly pedestrianise in the high street like other towns have done. That certainly would, in, would improve air quality. Um, it would improve an awful lot of things. But bearing in mind the, the um, intended location for this charger, that would rule anything out because once that's in and planning permission has been given, then, then that's out the window. Um, and I would also as Councillor Rowe has done, is refer members to the um, historic buildings and conservation advice that's been included within the document. The fact that the District Council has actually sought their advice is important, and their advice is that they don't think it is right that goes there, and that we should be looking at alternative options. And so I would also suggest that this goes back, deferred back to officers to look at alternative locations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Sepp, uh, any other visitors wanted to say anything? Not oh, right. So that's the end of your input, visitors. So it's now on to the committee. Councillor Steptoe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, some points of clarification, if I may, please. Um, why was this particular site picked? I uh, would be interested to know. Referring officers, um, as Councillor Wilkinson has already alluded to, 
um, on page 6.3, item 4.3, uh, this historic buildings and conservation advice is that this is detrimental to the uh, conservation area and recommends other more sympathetic locations are explored. To quote him, uh, there is no report, nothing comments in this report to say whether that has been done and if so, why were they not suitable? The other point of clarification I'd like is with regards to 4.4 on the same page, with regards to the gas company. It refers to the, uh, ga the equipment standing potentially on top of a gas main and that the cost of removing that or moving that would be our burden. It's suggesting there that uh, we should have uh, spoken to them and got their um, comments on that. I again see nothing in the report to say whether that has occurred and what the outcome of that is. Is it directly over a gas main? Uh, to my mind, electricity and gas don't really mix. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, can I, I, I just remind you as this debate continues that um, our visitors of uh, visiting spe uh, members have, have mentioned other locations and whether they could be explored or not. What we're looking at is this application that in this this location in front of us. It's not for us to determine another location and its suitability. It's for us to decide whether this application in in this location. Is, is suitable. So we just need to make sure we've got that, that focus. Councillor Eaves. Thank you, Chair. Uh, with respect, I have to uh, refer a little to what you've just alluded to. I had a very long meeting uh, with an officer where I was discussing air quality, and this particular issue came up. Now, one of the reasons being uh, why he was excited about uh, the inclusion of charging points in Rayleigh was the place that they could be would be in the car park <coughs> where it's very expensive to actually lay the main for these. Once it's in the car park, to extend it, you have the option. What you don't have with this site here is the uh, option to extend without further having to come back to us again for more planning uh, uh, issues and I, I can't see that there would be um, any uh, cause for us to want to um, agree to a line of these machines in the high street. Um, so on uh, the point of cost <coughs> to the council we've that, already... That, that's not a planning consideration. Okay, all right. Well. I think that the, the option of what's going to end up happening here with the size of this particular machine is it's going to uh, be changing the character of the high street quite considerably and the possibility of because of the cost of more coming in there, I, I understand what you're saying Chairman, of them being uh, coming back for more of these going in there uh, is, is quite pointless really. So the size um, and the position is completely inappropriate, I believe. Thank you. Councillor Cutmore. Thank you, Chairman. A lot of the points I was going to make have been raised, I'm pleased to say, and I won't repeat them, uh, other than to say that uh, the actual historic buildings of conservation advice does recommend more sympathetic uh, locations are explored, and that's their words, not yeah. mine. Uh, having said that, uh, if, there, if it were to be agreed tonight, can I ask the officers, please, to advise the actual space that we're talking about where the vehicles would park, would that be marked only for electric vehicles um, uh, or would it be marked so that anybody could park there? Uh, two reasons. One, obviously it takes up the spaces, but two, if another vehicle parked there, it stops somebody from actually using a charging point. But I do agree with the previous speakers about other locations. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to answer that question. Yeah. That is. Um, <coughs> so, as I understand it from my colleagues that work in environmental health, um, <coughs> if the application were approved, the intention would be to amend the traffic regulation order to um, 
which would result in this, this doesn't show it very clearly but there are two disabled bays and then two bays that are currently available for any vehicle to park in um, so the two disabled bays would remain the same restrictions and it's these two um, here which would be restricted for electric vehicles only um, and they would have the time limit um, that, that is all, all already there um, reimposed so up to an hour Councillor Stanley uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of questions do come into mind, uh, and, and perhaps if you've already asked them, uh, the officer's already done that. Um, the, where that is going to be situated, where you put that, those, as you say, there's two parking bays are disabled, and obviously they're used on a Wednesday. Um, does that are we go, are you going to then restrict the use of them? Uh, for for the market holders, store holders to use those bays, or, or is that going to be solely for parking or uh, parking of um, um, rechargeable vehicles? The other thing really is getting to mind is that, um, as may you may not all know, that uh, the power supplies all run down that side of the high street. There are no other power supplies the other side apart from tearing off and going under the under the road, the main road. Um, so all the power supplies run down that 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 side underneath the pavement, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why they decided to put them there in the first place, because uh, it's convenient and, and what have you. But um, there's no reason. Well, I don't see any reason why they have to be there. Um, we dig up the roads all the time and leave potholes behind as well. So I'm, I'm just uh, thinking that it's, it's the wrong place to be. It's very well used, that part of the high street. In fact, it's, it's, it's really crowded at times when you're climbing up outside the bank. Um, but it is very well used. If you could clarify that for the use of that parking base, is it solely for the restricted for um, uh, electrical charging or can can it be used uh, um, on, a, on Wednesdays and other market days? Yeah, so, sorry, to be clear, if you want to go back to the location plan, please, the first one. So, in this location, which is just um, adjacent to the curb there are four existing spaces so two of them are disabled and there'd be no change to the two disabled spaces at all they'd be solely for disabled um, cars and remain that way and then the two spaces that are adjacent to the proposed electric charging point the the intention is for an amendment to the traffic regulation order to mean that those spaces could only be used for electric um, cars to charge for up to an hour at a time. Um, and uh, I spoke to my colleague, there is no intention at the moment for any other restriction to be put into that traffic regulation order. Um, but just because there's no intention at the moment doesn't preclude um, a proposal being put forward to require that traffic regulation order to be slightly different, um, potentially to allow for um, market traders to utilise the spaces at certain times, it's essentially excluding the use um, just for dropping off um, and closing down market stalls. But I think the, uh, my colleague's um, view was that uh, market traders could use other bays um, because there are other bays in the vicinity of the market. Um, so the intention would be solely just to allow it for electric vehicles. Thank you. Councillor FD. Right. Listening to the arguments, it seems to be along the high street is where the main sticking point is, I think, at the moment. I'm not saying it's the best place, but I can see the logic of having charging points along the high street is where you've got the most amount of people most of the time and cars stopping and starting belch out a lot of smoke whereas electric cars don't. So I see there is a point for having them along the high street. But, but um, I see it's probably, it could not be the best place with what's underneath it. Okay. Just making that point. Um, when, when we look at the officer's reports, we see the, the recommendation and sometimes we, 
we interpret the evidence in slightly different ways. And I'm looking at, at 4.3 um, from the Historic Buildings and Conservation Advice, and I think I'm, I'm putting perhaps more weight on that argument uh, the, than the officers have on, on this occasion. Um, you could argue that there are some ugly bits of street furniture about in the high street already, and this is no more ugly than, the, than them, but I don't think having one untidy bit of furniture is, is, is a good enough reason to allow a, a, another one. And by anyone's standard, this isn't a pretty bit of furniture. I've not heard anyone at, at any stage say anything against it, the principle of electric charging. I, I think we can take that as, that, that as read. But the other thing that uh, strikes me is that the public get a great deal of amenity value from our high street from the views that they have, from the market, from the benches, from the ability to, to enjoy our, our famously wide high street. And I do think that the installation of this charging point in this location is, um, is, is detrimental to the, the, the public enjoyment of, of the street scene. I don't know that that's um, a particularly well-used argument, but uh, I think it's valid on this occasion. I also think, um, as pointed in 4.3, that this is not a sympathetic location. And so on that basis, um, if someone were to, to move for refusal, then I suspect I could support them. Councillor Stanley. Uh, well, first of all, I've, I've got to turn around and say that because of the uh, restriction that is imposed on that uh, parking area, um, it only allows those people that have got electric cars, and I know, only, I know of two people, so they could go and park there whenever they like. But I will do what the Chairman has asked and propose that... Um, this is not the ideal place for such a, uh, a large charging point and that it will um, detriment the, detrimental to the street scene uh, of Rayleigh. So Thank you're you. mo moving for refusal? Uh, yeah. Move to refuse, yeah. Right. Is there anyone happy to second that? That's, that's, right. that's the kennel. Apologies, thank you, Chairman. Uh, two questions or points of clarification, I guess, as, as a result of some of the, the questions. Um, the first one being, without wanting to suggest we move the location of this one, it would be nice to know for demand purposes if there is any intention to install these things in the high street um, as alternates or as supplements, potentially, and also if you'd be willing to take both questions at the same time. Um, when reading the application, I, I was a bit confused as to why we would lose a parking bay based on the, on the size of, of the piece. It doesn't seem to be more than the length of a vehicle. Therefore, I'm not really sure why we lose a space by doing this. Um, clarifications on those two points would be very useful. Thank you. I think we'd be careful about keeping the argument focused. It's, it's this application we're looking at just tonight, but <laughs> go on. So... Um, on the first point, I think any um, further proposal for the installation of a charging point in the highway would currently require planning permission by application to the local authority, whereas um, the other charging points that the council are putting in or intending to put in um, benefit from permitted development rights. Um, so the council have um, no ability to pull those applications before um, members. Um, they're permitted, um, providing that they meet certain criteria. So I don't know if there will be further applications, but certainly if there are any more proposed in the highway, they'll come before members. Um, but there is a mechanism within the council to discuss these things, but not, not for planning yeah. here tonight. And the second point is in terms of the actual charging point would be located on the footway. So set about 1.5 uh, metres back from the kerb into the footway where pedestrians are. Um, the reason why it would occupy parking spaces essentially is because the cars that um, are you know, plugged in to the charging point um, are going to be there for 30 minutes up to an hour um, to charge. 
So you, the, the, in terms of the loss of the parking spaces, the intention would be to change the traffic regulation order to only enable electric cars to utilise those spaces then. Okay. Right. I think we're get, getting into too much detail. It, it, the, this application isn't so much about the parking space, it's about the charger the uh, and the impact of the charger on, on the highway. Council, Can I just Council ask Western. one just one question? You were saying about, you say 1.5 metres from the curb. 0.5. My, I'm just, I've probably been a bit silly, this question is really, is when somebody is plugging it in, is anybody likely to go across the wire, whatever it is, being plugged in and cause an accident? I'm just, again, thinking of, you know, health and safety, um, accidents, etc., etc. Just how does that work, please? <coughs> I think it's close enough to the curb edge to prevent that. Um, I don't know if you go back to the yeah. image of the, the photograph image, but the, um, there's enough um, pedestrian footway surrounding that. It's a very wide footway. So there would be no need for a pedestrian to, to cross yeah. that little bit yeah, between the charging yeah. point and the car. Um, there's plenty of space surrounding. Right. I think we, we've, we've had most of the, the points raised. We, we have got a motion for refusal that's been seconded, but Councillor Steptoe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm not sure I can f fully res um, support outright f refusal. Um, personally, had I, uh, Councillor Stanley spoken first, I was going to propose deferment uh, because the officers will have, have listened to our concerns and our worries about where it is and go back and reassess the situation. Mm -hmm. So, personally, I would rather see deferment rather than outright refusal. Yeah. Well, the site is the site. Uh, at, uh, at, the, at the moment, we've got a motion for refusal, and um, the, site, the site is the site for the, for the application. Um, it, it would need to be a separate application if it was a different location. Right, members. So, Councillor Stanley has moved to refusal on the grounds that um, the location isn't sympathetic with the conservation area, and if I recall, it was the uh, loss of public amenity from the, the street scene, uh, as seconded by Councillor Efty. So, those members in favour of the refusal, please indicate. That's unanimous, then. That item is... Refused. Thank you. Next, we have land at the rear of 37 and 39 Downhall Road, Rayleigh. Proposed two detached three-bedroom dwellings. Who's doing this one? Oh, myself. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, this application proposes... Um, the redevelopment of land to the rear of 37 and 41 Downhall Road. See that. Um, <coughs> this is for the erection of two two-storey dwelling houses and laying out of private amenity and car parking. The site plan um, shows the parcel of land outlined in red forms part of the residential curtilage for number 37 to 41 Downhall Road. The site is considered as a backland development, which is supported by both national and local policies. Paragraph 70 of the a national planning policy framework encourages backland development uh, where development would not cause harm to local area, whereas policy DM3 of the development management plan seeks um, demonstration that backland development positively addresses the existing street pattern and density of local locality and whether the number and type of dwellings are appropriate to the locality. The proposed plots would achieve a 21.2 metre plot width. Um, an approximate one metre separation distance would be achieved between the dwellings and the flank boundaries in accordance with our council supplementary planning document to housing design. Moving on to the elevations, um, the layout skull, um, scale bulk and um, of the proposed dwellings are considered acceptable. The proposed <coughs> dwellings are mirrored. A traditional design has been applied to the dwellings whereby it would be finished in brick and timberboard in, clad in, uh, together with pantal roof tiles. And the proposed mixed pallet of material harmonises the surrounding street scene. Um, moving back to the site plan, uh, I don't know if you can see that properly. Um, um, plot A has a 11.4 um, metre distance to the rear boundary. 
um, has a 30 metre distance from the rear elevation of 37 and 39 Downhill Road and also has a 28 metre distance from um, the proposed dwelling, plot A, to number 9 Cheapside East. Um, plot B has a 12.6 uh, metre distance to the rear boundary um, and has an 18 metre distance to, number to the dwelling um, at the rear. Um, the distance between the proposed dwellings and the surrounding neighbour neighbouring dwellings are considered to be adequate. Um, windows would exist at first floor level, uh, level in the northern and southern ele flank elevations. Uh, these would serve a bedroom uh, but would appear secondary in nature. A condition requiring obscure glazing of the windows in these elevations is recommended to mitigate against the potential for overlooking upon the neighbouring properties to north and south. Uh, the proposed fen fenestration in all elevations have been carefully positioned and there are sufficient distances between the proposed development and the surrounding residential properties to not overlook the private amenity spaces of the surrounding residential properties. Um, also, each proposed dwelling has a garden area in excess of 100 square metres. Um, and also the boundary treatment has a uh, 1.8 metre high fence which would enclose the site to all boundaries. To all boundaries. Moving on to the tree plan, um, there are 10 trees and a group of trees located on the site. An agricultural impact assessment accompanied the application. Some of the trees and hedgerow would be removed to facilitate the development. It has been identified that one tree is due for removal as a result of its poor condition. Four trees, one hedge and a group of trees are proposed to be removed to facilitate the development, but due to their relatively low amenity um, value or poor conditions, uh, they are not worthy of influencing any layout and, and one tree is also at risk of damage for the root protection and area disturbance. The remainder of the trees would be retained and uh, protective me methods would be employed. Additionally, new boundary head and, and tree planting would take place as part of the proposal. Um, a tree surveying schedule and a tree protection plan uh, was provided, which is in accordance with the principle laid out with the British Standards uh, 5837-2012. Moving back to the site plan, um, oh, there we are. Um, the site would incorporate the free bin system per dwelling promoted by Rochester District Council. Uh, these bins would be stored safely within the curtilage of the application site. The proposed development would utilise an existing crossover, um, which, if I show you, which, which leads on to Cheapside East. Um, currently, there are five garages um, which would be retained as part of this proposal, and it is intended that the garages would be used by future occupants of the proposed dwellings. These garages are currently used by the occupants of numbers 37 to 41, Downhall Road. However, there are adequate off-street car parking provisions at the front of these uh, dwellings and therefore these garages are surplus to requirement. Whilst these garages do not measure to the desired dimensions as stipulated in the parking standards, it is an existing car parking arrangement that is considered adequate to accommodate off-street uh, parking provision for two dwellings, which would be in the form of two car parking spaces per dwelling plus one visitor space. If necessary, additional car parking space could be accommodated to the front of the garages, measuring to the required dimensions. The existing access measures approximately 2.4 metres wide and would remain unaltered. The width of the driveway is considered ad adequate. Um, we have consulted with I uh, Essex uh, County Council Highway Authority who concur, concur with this approach and no objections have been raised subject to appropriate conditions. Uh, each proposed dwelling would have an adequate amount of off-street car parking in accordance with the parking standards. It is not considered that the proposed development would be to the detriment of highway safety or the free flow of traffic and therefore no objections are raised that could be sustained on appeal. Further to this, uh, highways, um, the Highway Authority has been contacted again regarding the width of the, the um, access and the circulation and manoeuvring of vehicles within the site um, and they've come back stating that as the access is existing and was not proposed to be changed within the application, the Highway Authority had to consider the proposal based on whether the new dwellings would cause an intensification of a substandard access or whether it would be acceptable as the existing use of the site was for garages and the dwellings would not likely cause any further vehicle movement into site, the access is considered acceptable to the Highway Authority. Similar the, with the turning area within the site, this is an existing situation which currently accommodates up to five cars in relation to the garages and therefore the situation would also be unlikely to change with the proposed dwellings, meaning that it is acceptable. The fact that the access and turning area are existing and the additional two dwellings 
um, on the land would have very little to no impact on highway terms and the application was deemed uh, to be acceptable highway authority. Um, on this basis, it's, it is considered that proposed dwelling comply with both national and local policies. Therefore, the application has been recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mercer again. <coughs> Start the clock on her. <coughs> Should just say, uh, just as usual, it's five minutes for our speakers to let you know if we've got a minute to go. Thank you, councillors. As you know, this proposal is for the development of two three-bedroom detached dwellings with two storeys at the rear of 37 and 39 Downhall Road in an area that is currently garden. One of the issues the Town Council objected to on this proposal is the access to the new dwellings, which is narrow, the width of this being 2.342 metres, about the width to allow access of a transit van. This access is bordered by the exterior walls of 7 and 9 Cheapside East. The design and access statement says 9 and 11, which is incorrect. At present, cars and vans use this access, but in order for this development to occur, larger vehicles will be needed to access the site. This may cause damage to the exterior walls of 7 and 9 Cheapside East, something already stated by a resident, and may even cause them to become unstable. The access is long, so there will be occasions when there will be an obstruction to a vehicle coming from the opposite direction. This could lead to an obstruction of the highway in Cheapside East if the vehicle is coming out of the development. A vehicle may have to reverse out and the visibility is not clear. It can get quite congested on the road at times when parking is allowed and it could be extremely dangerous for pedestrians using the access. If the development is built, there will still be a need for refuse lorries to access the site. And what if there was a fire? Is there enough room for a fire engine to access in a hurry? The delay in them taking care to drive down this access due to its narrowness could be a matter of life and death. I find no mention of the connection to the water and sewage, although it may be there. I take it that there will not be a cesspit, otherwise that would mean another large vehicle having to access the site on a regular basis. The increase in vehicle usage will cause disturbance to the residents of both Seven and Nine Cheapside East. The officer has stated that the garages do not measure to the desired dimensions as stipulated in the parking standards and that additional car parking spaces can be accommodated to the front of the garages if required. Visitors will still may have to park on Cheapside East, a restricted parking road, or cause obstruction in the parking area allocated to these properties. Surely we should be adhering to parking standards and ensuring that garages are the correct size to enable a car to be parked within them. Parking issues were another objection by the Town Council, but this was not stated in the officer's report. We feel this is undesirable backland development, another objection not mentioned in the report, and should be rejected by councillors due to its lack of adequate parking, which is below the required size, and inadequate access due to the narrow narrowness of the entrance and the potential for damage to the encompassing properties. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Blake, say now. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, so firstly, I would like to give some background and our thoughts on, on why we decided to go with this development and how we decided to go with it. Um, we first um, wanted to create a sympathetic development in that area, one that was not um, massively impactful on the surrounding buildings, the surrounding neighbourhood. Um, as such, we uh, applied for a pre-planning application whereby we discussed this with a member of the planning committee. Um, they um, advised us that in, in their mind this uh, potentially could be acceptable backland development and we should go ahead. Um, with this in mind and with regards to uh, the local neighbourhood, we came up with the design of the houses which are not full height to, um, to mitigate some of the uh, potential overlooking or the impact on the area. Um, and we considered the parking spaces also that were already available to allocate to that, uh, that development. 
Um, as has been mentioned many times, the parking or the garages are not up to current standard, um, but they do uh, fit, uh, for instance, my, my Land Rover, my Range Rover. Um, they are of a good size. Um, and I think the whole area that is available for parking can accommodate all the uh, parking that's required, be it in its current form or a rejigging of that to make that available. Um, I come on to the access that has also been a bone of contention um, in response to, uh, to uh, the previous speaker. Um, fire engines, I've done some digging here and, and chatted to the local fire brigade. Um, they in fact actually uh, carry the no normal water tenders will carry three 18 metre length hoses. They prefer actually not to be near a building on fire for safety reasons for their personnel and actually would prefer um, a muse style development uh, as this is where they can run the hoses away from the fire tenders and, and um, coordinate their, uh, their efforts that way. Um, delivery guys, delivery vans, yes, agreed. They can't get down there or it'd be tough for them to get down there. But again, as we see in Hamilton Muse off of Nelson Road, they will park on the main road and make their delivery from there. It's nothing um, new, I don't believe. Um, with regards to, uh, it was mentioned about a 1.8 metre um, fencing, um, we, uh, my co-applicant and myself, were going to hold a conversation with the neighbours to see whether A, they want that, but being as it's part of the planning conditions we need to put that in, or whether they would uh, prefer an also planting of, of trees, hedgerows, something that's a little bit less harsh on that. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Just a tiny little point of correction, if you don't mind. Sorry. When, when you mentioned the pre-planning advice, it was with the officers, not members of the committee. Oh, Just, yes. That would have been wrong. Councillor Lumley. Thank you, Chairman. I called this application into the Development Committee for a member decision, and I'm grateful to the officers also for arranging a site visit. This site visit was important to me as the access to the site of this backland development is through the long alleyway flanked by walls of two existing properties, 7 and 9 Cheapside East. This narrow access needed to be seen to be believed. I know it's been mentioned several times, but it's really critical to this development. It's been described in the report, uh, I believe, as a private driveway, and now we've heard the officer tonight refer to it as a crossover. This alleyway is access to five garages of existing properties in Downhall Road, numbers 37 to 41, and as we've heard, is cyclist to requirements and used as workshops now. We are told there is adequate parking for those properties now on their front driveways in Downhall Road. The alleyway itself is an uneven, rutted surface of large pebbles. It's not suitable for large or heavy vehicles and it will create a disturbance from more vehicle use. As has already been said, how will emergency services access the properties? Okay, we've had an answer about the fire service, but what about ambulance service? Uh, access to these um, proposed properties, how, it, how is that going to be for uh, refuse vehicles? Removal vehicles, how do oc occupants move their possessions into their homes? How will they receive deliveries? We've heard that they can all be delivered from outside in Cheapside East. How will building materials be brought to the site? Uh, um, representation number 35 on page 14 of the report states that loading and unloading of materials to be within the curtilage of the site. Not quite sure how they will do that. There is daytime restriction to parking in Cheapside East. Any loading and unloading would create an obstruction for neighbouring properties. The boundary walls of the houses either side have both been damaged in the past from vehicles accessing the garages through this alleyway. <coughs> Bin collection. The access to the alleyway is flanked by the drives to the properties of number seven and number nine, so there's no space to place four refuse bins each week for collection without causing obstruction to the footpath. The Highway Authority, number 35, page 14 of the report, refers to two on-site parking spaces per dwelling to be provided, plus a visitor space. I understand that the occupant of number nine, Cheapside East, 
has right of way over part of this land to the gate to the rear access to his property since his father had this um, covenant in 1948 and himself in 1989. It is likely, I understand, that a proportion of the proposed parking spaces or visitor space would obstruct part of this right of way. I saw nothing in the report about the impact on the property in Oakwood Road, unless that was what was referred to as south of plot B, I believe. Um, has this been taken into consideration? This is much lower level, and there was some concern previously about overlooking of this particular property. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry, sorry, but it's just got to be the, the way that the committee goes. Um, Jeff, forgive me, it's unbearable. Would you like me to tinker with the air conditioner as I usually do, do to make it quiet some, and cool? Yes, please tinker away. Um, have I got uh, Councillor Stanley? Uh, uh, any other non-members wanting to speak? No, Councillor Stanley. Chairman, can I just say your microphone is going on or off? So I'm not sure how much of your what you're saying is being recorded. <coughs> What's your mic? There we go, Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm. I'm going to express a view of what's, what happened to me uh, and my family uh, on a particular location where we had a driveway, shared driveway, which was between um, two properties very similar to this at the front of the driveway and two properties at I the rear. Now, I know what you're going to say, so well, just let me, just uh, let me I, point I, this I out. I can't let you I go on, Councillor Stanley, unless it's... It's relevant. planning points yeah, re it's going to be a specifically point. relevant to this. It is. Thank you. Um, uh, on the basis of parking, uh, that's what it's relevant to. Um, and it's nice to have a, a community that work together. But if you have someone that doesn't want to work with you, um, it can cause great upheaval. Um, and not only to the uh, the the people that are parking there, but to people that are on the street further. Um, I do feel that um, the, the th I think it's the third, uh, you can just about see it on the, on the, on the picture there, uh, a corrugated, silver corrugated um, uh, garage. If that man was to bring his car out of that garage, which he can do, there's no reason why he can't. They've got it up there uh, beyond those garages. As you can see, it's beyond those set of garages that are there already. If he brings his car out, he will block the driveway. There is no doubt about it whatsoever. So, and, and on that basis alone, that uh, he could restrict anyone trying to get out or anyone trying to get in, as that may be. Um, so I think that this is a very tight area for parking. And I don't think it's, it's, it, it's not, the properties are very nice. I'm, I'm more than happy. If you've got bikes, that's fine. If you've got a mini, that's fine. But unfortunately, if you get a car out of that garage, and that's quite a big garage, that's a double garage he's got there. Um, if he gets his car out, it's, there's, there's gonna be problems on parking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, like many other councillors here, I attended the site visit and my biggest concern on this is, is the access to this site. It does concern me that it is such a, a narrow access. Thank you. Councillor Reeves. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand everyone's concern about the access, but as Essex Highways have already given us a judgment on that, I'm not sure how much weight we can put on that. But my concern, Councillor Lumley has alluded to it, there is a provision on the, uh, the development for uh, place for bins but there is no provision for bin collection now because the drive is so long I'm not sure that we can expect our refuse collection people to actually walk all the way down the the drive therefore the expectation would be that the bins would be put out on the road but there is nowhere on the road for them to go uh, and I would like to see clarification on what is going to be done about refuse day collection with the bins because I can see that being an obstruction every week. 
I'd like to propose that as, as a deferment to, on clarification. Uh, well, we'll, we'll come to the officers um, for an answer on that in, in a minute. Um, I, I do agree with, with what, what you've said about, about highways. Highways don't support the concern about that, and quite clearly it's, it is currently demonstrated as, an ac as a usable access route to the garages. Um, the, the, the principle of the, the, the properties, um, although we, we found back the principle of backland development undesirable, um, it's something that has a, a policy compliance. The properties themselves are um, not, not compromised, the gardens aren't compromised. Um, I think we'll, we'll take officer comment now on, on the bins and the strength of that as a planning consideration and whether putting bins in front of the drive is acceptable or not. Um, I think it's given that it's two dwellings that are proposed, um, the onus would be on the occupiers to drag those bins to the, to the highway edge. It's mm -hmm. only those occupiers that would then be using the driveway. Um, so I think given that that the bins would have to be stored um sort of potentially you know on the highway in front of the driveway um temporarily during collection because there's not really a, an alternative unless the uh, refuse collectors are willing to um collect them from mm. within that sort of parking area um in front of the garages that's a wilson Thank you, Chairman. Could I come back on the point the officer just made, that uh, that would penalise the, the potential residents because everyone else has to put their bin three foot from their boundary. So we're saying these people won't, so they won't well, then comply with their environment. We're, 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 we're not saying that. I think we're, we're starting to, to stray in how someone will choose to manage their lifestyle. Um, uh, as opposed to um, specific planning issues, um, you have to take a view on how much weight you put to that that, that, that argument yourself. Um, it's been a fairly brief discussion, members, but we do have a recommendation for approval printed on page 7.1.8. So can I ask... You, you, yeah, please. I mean, just, just a bit of clarity. I mean, I mean the the bins we, we can ask to where there's going to be presented. So in in this instance, it may not be popular with the residents of, um, of those proposed developments, and we can actually say, well, actually, you put them at the end of your driveway. So they're on the driveway. Then, so. It, it would block their access in and out, but you could insist that they put there. And if that's what they're, and, and if they're entering into that purchase at the time, then that's what they're doing. The, the, now you may say they may not choose to do that, but in terms of, um, uh, I, I guess, is this compliant in terms of, of an application? In, in terms of where the bin storage is, is, is it adequate? Is there is there a way of um, managing that disposal? And the answer is yes in terms of policy. But as, I said, as you said, you, you may have to take a different view. But certainly, it's policy compliant. So members, I'm pushing forward to the motion for approval printed on 7.1.8. So can I ask then, those members in favour of the approval, please indicate. I'm afraid I've got to support the actual view on this one. Right, those against. So that item is not approved. It's not approved. Do you want to count? Did you count? Did you get those numbers? Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 that, that item's not approved, so we now we now we now need to move forward. We need we need an alternative motion. We can't just not approve something. Do we want to move against? I'll move against. I think no it's refusal. The, uh, the narrow access of within the, going into the property. Right. Councillor Cutmore. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, may I just ask the officers, I mean, we, uh, and I think Councillor Eves has, has 
put this forward, the fact that we are going against what highways are saying, and if we were to go to any <laughs> any sort of appeal on that basis, we I think we'd clearly lose. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, I'd just like okay. the officer's opinion on that, really. I think um, in terms of highway... Um, Sorry, in terms of actual highway safety impacts, the MPPF is quite clear that a highway impact has to be severe in order to refuse a planning application. And I think in this situation, we're talking about two dwellings accessed by, yes, a narrow access, but, you know, they're going to be <coughs> conscious of, you know, using the access um, sensibly. Um, you know, it's their access that they need to use. Um, it's not serving more than two two dwellings and, and uh, only their visitors. It's not going to be heavily used by traffic. Um, and I don't think that the access would be a substantial danger to highway safety or, or pedestrian safety in this instance. All right. uh, members, you, you've read... It wasn't the question I asked you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go again, Ruth. I said, Chairman, if, if there are any uh, circumstances which we would go to appeal, would it be a reason that we could defend? Sorry, in terms of the access? Yeah. Yeah. Just no. We're talking about the width of the access and, and the, the actually width of the taking access. it forward, etc. You know, uh, and I think Councillor Reeves has already made the point. That was, the, that was what I was trying to raise. Yeah. I think you're sort of agreeing with me, but... Uh, I am I, agreeing with saying, you in that. You know, is, it, is it defensible? And I think no. you're saying, no, it is no. Sorry, no. <laughs> no. We so we, we, our view would be that, that no, it isn't, given that it only serves two properties. All right, members, we, 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 have, we have two options, two directions that we, uh, that we go down. We can't just not approve it. We then have to either refuse it or take another course of action, and the only other course of action that's been talked about this evening is deferment. We've had advice from officers that refusal might be hard to substantiate, but I'm in your hands as to what direction we go next. Councillor Steptoe. Chairman, can I suggest we pr propose a, a deferment for the applicant to go back, he's heard our concerns and our worries, to go back and look at the uh, situation and then come back to us. So I'd, I'd propose deferment. Would anyone like to second that? Councillor Eaves, right. Does any, anyone feel we need to have further discussion on that? Can I, those members in favour of the deferment, please indicate. Thank you. That item is deferred. Right. Next item uh, seven, this is the site of 22 and 24 South End Road, Hockley. Thank you. Okay, who's got this one? Yeah, you thank you. Location plan, please. Thank you. Members, the application site is, is Ed Red on this plan here, and you'll see it has a frontage onto South End Road and a frontage onto Great Eastern Road. The site is occupied currently by a pair of semi-detached bungalows, um, which are to be demolished as part of the proposal. There are three existing vehicular accesses to the site, one here on South End Road, one partway along Great Eastern Road, and one to the northern boundary, also onto Great Eastern Road. In terms of the context, there is a neighbouring property to the north, which is a chalet bungalow, number one, Grace Eastern Road. Um, and to the west, there is a, a terrace of properties. It's number 26, South End Road, that is immediately adjacent to the western boundary. Um, in the wider context, this area of Hockley is residential in character, and there's a flatted block opposite and other residential properties in and around. As you go westwards along South End Road, members will be familiar with the fact that um, 
you get closer towards the town centre and some of the um, ground floor um, of the units along here are commercial but it has a residential feel to it as well until you approach um, the spa roundabout. The proposed development then is for an L-shaped building containing eight flats. The building would be set slightly forward of the sort of existing building line along Great Eastern Road and also slightly forward of the terraced properties on South End Road. One vehicle access point is proposed to the site and that is utilising one of the existing access points, the one adjacent to the northern <coughs> boundary. A car parking court is proposed to the rear. Um, a member's apologies, um, but the report... Um, incorrectly states 14 car park parking spaces. There are 12 parking spaces proposed, um, some of which are adjacent um, to the western boundary, others are underneath a um, an undercroft um, to the building, um, to partly here and then partly under this elevation here. Soft landscaping is proposed to the site frontage. Um, largely that would be um, just amenities, a sort of uh, landscaping, tree planting, but some small terraces um, serving the individual flats are also proposed to the ground floor to, to both um, frontages. If I can take you through to some of the photos, please, I'll just show you the existing uh, situation at the site. So photo two, yep, this shows the existing pair of semi-detached bungalows um, which are to be demolished and you can see um, just in the distance that uh, is the dormer to the neighbouring property, um, number one Great Eastern Road to the north and you can see just some of the context of the surroundings, um, two-storey houses of a, a general traditional design and form. Take you to the next one please. Sorry. Yep, so this is showing um, westbound, so South End Road. Um, this is the, the pair of semi-detached properties that will be demolished. This is the side elevation of number 26, South End Road, um, adjacent to the site. And you can see the deep frontage. The proposed building will be set slightly forward of this building line on South End Road. And again, you can see in the distance some of the context with the commercial here, flatted development, flats above and then the, the flatted block, which is two-storey um, opposite the site. Next one, please. So this is the view going um, northbound. This is the adjacent property, number one, Great Eastern Road. This is one of the existing access points that which would be stopped up, and the access point that is proposed to be used is the, on the northern side of this bus stop here. Next one, please. Oh, and then this shows the other access point which will be stopped up on South End Road just past the um, pedestrian crossing. Um, and the two-storey uh, two terrace um, is adjacent. That's number 26. I can take you to the next plan, please. This is the layout plan. <coughs> you can just bump it up a little bit. So this shows you the layout of the site in more detail. Um, you can see the access point here um, and then accessing the parking court. So you'd have spaces along here um, and sp these spaces are in the undercroft um, as are these two spaces here. One of the spaces is, um, meets the disabled bay size. There is a communal garden area proposed to the rear which um, is important given that some of the, the terraces, uh, particularly to the ground floor flats, um, are quite near to the, the public realm, quite near to the footway and don't afford much privacy to the, to the users. So there's this area of communal space which will be um, available to all. Um, the bike cycle store um, is here um, and then the bin store is, is in this area here adjacent the western boundary. Um, there would be only be pedestrian access here to the bin store and the cycle store off South End Road. If I can take you to the elevations, please. <coughs> so the top line shows you the elevation proposed to Great, uh, yeah, Great Eastern Road. Sorry, This is the property immediately north, which is number one, which is a kind of modest chalet-style um, bungalow. Um, as you can see, um, the building proposed is of significant length. Um, it is broken up um, by the um, architectural detailing, so you've got this gable projection here. It has got a substantial flat roof dormer element. Um, it's above a terrace, which as a design feature is considered acceptable. There are two smaller um, flat roof dormers as well to that elevation. 
Um, the one below then is the South End Road frontage. Um, so this is number 26. You'll see that the building proposed is, is slightly higher um, than that building. Um, and again, this frontage is of significant length. Um, the side elevations here show this is the side elevation which would immediately be adjacent to number one Great Eastern Road. So there's no fenestration immediately in that elevation that would be close and perhaps give rise to concerns about overlooking. The windows here um, are in the part of the building that is this bit here to the back of this bit. And so the distance of between those windows and the rear garden of number one is significant and would not um, give rise to concerns with overlooking. This um, elevation here, just, this is the undercroft, um, and this is the elevation that would face the side garden of number 26 South End Road. There is a terrace proposed here, but that would have an obscure um, screen to prevent um, un unacceptable overlooking to that neighbouring garden. If I can take you to some of the perspectives, these give an impression, an artistic impression of the development um, as built. So this is to South End Road, um, number 26 here, and, and this shows the proposed development there with the tree planting to the frontage, the boundary treatments, um, and the details of the soft landscaping would be um, dealt with by condition. Take you to the next one, please. This is the Great Eastern Road um, elevation. So this is number one, immediately adjacent. This is the proposed access through here. Um, the building has been staggered slightly, so it's slightly lowered in relation to, the, to, the, to number one. Um, and you'll see the terrace here with the flat roof element above. I think there might be one more. And then that's just the corner feature. So as you come down South End Road, um, there's, there's a sort of an attempt to um, create a bit of a, a design feature with the sort of significant elements of glazing to that um, elevation. If I can take you then to just the layout plan, if you could just keep that up, I think. Redevelopment of the site is considered acceptable for residential use in principle. The key considerations in this application are the appropriateness of the proposed development in terms of the effect of the proposal on the character and appearance of the street scene and on living conditions of future occupiers and neighbouring properties. The surrounding character is mixed. The proposal would be significantly greater in scale than existing and in comparison to other neighbouring properties as well. Members will note, the, however, that we had um, positive comments from Urban Design at the County Council. An officer's view is, therefore, that the proposal is appropriate in this regard. All the flats, um, ground, first and second floor, would meet the minimum space standards, and it is considered that appropriate amenity space would be afforded to all the residents. The flats would have um, terraces or balconies and then this communal space as well. The parking provision is also considered acceptable given that each flat would have at least one space with some, with some potentially having two allocated spaces. Um, visitors would have the ability to use um, public car parks which are close by in the vicinity on South End Road. The site is considered to be uh, a fairly uh, main urban area. It has good access to public transport. It is within walking distance um, clearly of a bus stop, but also of the railway station um, in Hockley nearby. Um, the proportion of parking provision is similar to that allowed nearby at other sites um, down S um, South End Road. So we've got numbers um, 49 and 47 South End Road, um, which had a similar proportion of public um, car parking allowed fairly recently. 49 South End Road um, was a development of five two-bed properties and had six spaces. 47 um, was for one beds with four spaces but no visitor parking. We ha also had a development um, fairly nearby at one Woodlands Road, which is sort of on near the, to the, um, the roundabout at the end of South End Road here. Um, that was a development of seven two-bed properties with nine spaces provided, which was one per flat, one per two-bed, plus two visitor spaces. The recommendation, Chairman, is one of approval subject to the recommended planning conditions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Crowder James is going to speak on this one as the applicant, the agent. <coughs> Five minutes. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen Crowder-James and I'm the agent for this application. I would like to reiterate the views of your officers that the proposal meets the objectives of the National Planning Policy Framework in terms of making the most efficient use of sustainable, previously developed sites for the provision of residential development, an objective that is mirrored in your local plan, which seeks to secure more housing development in sustainable locations. It's therefore considered that residential development on this site is acceptable in principle, and this is agreed by your professional officers and other statutory consultees through the recommendation to grant planning permission for this development. As you will see from the officer's report, this proposal has evolved over several years following detailed consultation with the Council. The consultation started with a positive pre-application meeting back in January 2017, which included written support from place services. The consultation on this development continued through the determination of the application to ensure that the proposal could be fully supported in planning and design terms. This dialogue resulted in the reduction of the number of units proposed and various amendments to the design of the development to ensure officers' support. This is a testament to your officers and an excellent example of how the planning process works best through proactive discussion. While the application before you is supported by your professional officers, it is acknowledged that there have been several objections raised to this application by local residents, mainly centred upon the principle of providing a flatted development in this location and relating to transport, traffic, impact on amenity and design. I therefore turn to the specific design elements of this scheme in order to demonstrate that this development should be considered acceptable in planning terms. The design has been created by a local experienced architect who is familiar with the site, the town and the wider area. It has therefore been specifically designed to relate to this particular site's context and constraints and found to be acceptable and appropriate by the urban design team at Essex County Council. In terms of the concern that the site is overdeveloped, the site occupies a large corner plot in a highly sustainable location close to the village centre, rail centre, rail station and local amenities. As confirmed by Essex Place Services within their pre-application response, the existing site is considered to be underdeveloped and thus the site con constitutes a good development opportunity. In addition, the corner nature of the plot provides an ideal opportunity for the development to become a feature building in the streetscape. Essex Place Services also consider that the proposed layout makes good use of the site and that the building footprint is appropriate for the location. Concerns have been raised suggesting that the proposal would create an unacceptable impact on the amenity of neighbouring residents. However, the proposal would not breach the 45 degree angle rule of thumb. Accordingly, the proposal would not lead to overshadowing of neighbouring properties, nor would it have a detrimental impact on the level of amenity that ought to be reasonably expected. Furthermore, respectable and policy compliant separation distances to shared boundaries would be provided and the existing building line is respected. Also, the side wall that would face number one Great Eastern Road has been designed so it broadly is in line with the rear elevation of this property so as not to be overbearing. In addition, the windows on the ground floor would not result in any overlooking or loss of privacy. Similarly, the design has been amended so there's been no living room windows on the upper floors that could overlook the adjacent dwelling on South End Road. Privacy screens are also proposed to ensure there be no overlooking from the terraces that face west. In addition, the proposal provides acceptable and usable amenity space in the form of private terraces and a communal area. Highways officers have confirmed that the level of parking is appropriate and the provision of secure cycle spaces to promote alternative forms of transport has been welcomed. The proposed car parking area allows for all vehicles to enter and leave in a forward-facing gear. We know there have been some concerns over the access and the proximity to the bus stop, but the technical officers confirmed that the proposed access is appropriate for the development. The scheme has been amended to ensure there is full provision for waste and recycling areas that each resident can access this area from the rear of their properties. In summary, the proposal is fully, fully policy compliant and acceptable in design terms and has the support of policy officers, development management officers, highways officers and county design. We therefore consider there are no justifiable and valid planning reasons to refuse this uh, planning permission. We therefore respectfully request that you support your professional officers and vote in favour of the grant of planning permission for this development. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Councillor Hudson, you've referred this one, so off you go. Would you prefer I sat, stayed here or come up there? Or no, would no, you? stay there. You, you're content? Yes. Thank you, sir. Before I proceed, I like it to confirm that uh, I'm not a member of the development committee, therefore the rules of predetermination don't apply to me. Uh, you'll be very pleased to hear that, Chairman, because I've been uh, able to marshal my thoughts appropriately and uh, my, uh, uh, my comments only take up one and a half pages. So. Chairman, I have requested 
that this planning application be considered by the members of your development committee as opposed to being determined solely by a planning officer. As my objections to this application relate primarily to subjective assessments. This, in my opinion, is best determined by a well-trained committee of councillors who reside within our district and who are elected to represent the best interests of our residents, including the residents that I represent this evening. I have a great deal of respect for our planning officers and that respect has developed over many years of councillor officer association. I therefore have confidence in working through and using the officer's comprehensive report to express my views. On page three, paragraph 13, she reminds us of the NPPF requirements which state, the NPPF encourages the effective use of land to provide much needed housing. And she goes on to say, in principle, housing is appropriate at this site. However, additional housing should not be to the detriment of the character and appearance of the locality. It should be sympathetic to local character and history, including the surrounding built environment. Not my words, it's our officer's words. I agree, it should be sympathetic to local character, including the surrounding built environment. This application is not sympathetic by any stretch of the imagination. Page four, paragraph 14, proposals should contribute positively to making places better for people. Agreed. Paragraph 15, housing development should ensure that developments do not undermine quality of life. I agree. Paragraph 16, policy H1 of the core strategy states that in order to protect the character of existing settlements, the council will resist the intensification of smaller sites within residential areas. That's our own rules. Page five, paragraph 19, there is a clear policy expectation that development involving intensification should relate well to the existing street pattern, density and character of the locality. Chairman, this proposed development will be detrimental to the character and appearance of the location. It will not contribute to making the place better for the people who already live there. It will undermine the quality of their lives. It contravenes the Council's own core strategy policy, policy 8H1, beg your pardon, policy H1, which states we will resist the intensification of smaller sites as it will significantly alter the street pattern, density and character of the locality. And this is all clearly confirmed by our planning officers in their report by their statements page 5, paragraph 23, the proposed flatted block would be substantial in size. Paragraph 24, whilst not necessarily in keeping with the immediate surroundings in terms of size, the report continues in a similar vein and it even points out the need for privacy screens to prevent unreasonable overlooking, etc. The planning department have stated these things, but still they recommend approval. I find this most contradictory and suggest that this committee determines the sense of the matter. Not me, not the planning officer, but you chairman and your committee. I will finish with a simple methodology of measurement in order to demonstrate that this proposed development is simply way too big and totally inappropriate for this location. And that is parking. Our planning department consults with the Essex Highways Authority, and rightly so, with respect to matters relating to transportation, and parking provision forms a part of that consultation. Whilst our officers have confirmed acceptance of the majority of the Highway Authority's report, our officers have chosen to go against the Highways Authority's recommendation relating to parking provision, both in the number and size of the parking bays. Well, we all know it is extremely difficult to fit a pint into a half pint pot without some running down the side of the glass, and in this case, running off the site and down the road somewhere. This is confirmed by our, by our officers within their report on page 11, paragraphs 50 and 51. Policy T8 parking standards require two bedroom flats to have two parking spaces and a quarter of a parking bay 
per flat for visitors. That makes a requirement for, full, for 18 full-size bays. Our officers in paragraph 50 have indicated that the development must place reliance on the local pay and display car park in South End Road to provide for visitors parking. Not my words, that's our officers' words. Again, Chairman, I am somewhat nonplussed as another of this council's strategies, namely the Hockley Area Action Plan, which was adopted on the 25th of February 2014 and approved by the Secretary of State's Inspector, provides for a consolidation of public parking within the village of Hockley to be at the rear of the Eldon Way Industrial Estate. With the option of the local pay and display car park referred to by our officers for the use of visitors to this proposed development being used for, and I quote, <coughs> library, health centre, retail and private parking for flats above. The pay and display car park would therefore no longer be available. Chairman, I put it to you that this proposed development is a gross overdevelopment of a very modest site, a development which fails to provide for the fundamental requirements of either the National Planning Policy Framework or of this council's suite of adopted planning rules, regulations and strategies. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councillor Mrs Mason. Um, before I speak, uh, Mr Chairman, could I just ask a clarification on one point? The previous speaker, not Councillor Hudson, the lady for the applicant, I believe she said, unless I misheard, that the building line had been respected. Um, could you just show us the pr proposed building line? Because I'm not sure if I misheard. It's probably best to go to... Because I thought it was bringing it forward. Yes, if, thank you. If you so. zoom into this one, maybe you can see it. So the development is, if you drew a line, uh, you know, from the front elevation and pretty much these properties are in line, it's slightly forward of um, these properties on Great Eastern Road and also slightly forward of the properties. So it's, on not, it's not respecting it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just needed that clarification because I thought I'd misread the plan. Thank you. Oh, I need this mic on, don't I, Mr Chairman? Um, thank you. Um, as you're aware, I have an other pecuniary interest, and I've been advised by the monitoring officer that once I've spoken, I have to leave the chamber. Um, that said, I would like to make some points on this very concerning application. As we can see, the existing bungalows are set back from the adjacent properties, both in South End and Great Eastern Road, given an appearance of openness. Despite the proximity to Hockley Centre, this is a predominantly residential area. With the exception of Holly Court opposite, which is set well back from the road and thereby increasing the openness aspect of this entrance to Hockley, the nearby area is of mixed terraced houses, semi-detached and detached bungalows and houses. The several purpose-built flatted blocks referred to in the officer's report are relatively new and at greater proximity to the town centre than the location of this proposal, which is on the edge of the village. The nearby buildings that would be in the same visual location are one, one and a half or two storey height, not three storey. This would be a height that is out of keeping with the area. However much we need additional housing, this should not be at the expense of residential amenity nor should we ignore our own policies and very modest minimum requirements. Yet this application appears to be doing just that. The MPPF states that additional housing should not be to the detriment of character and appearance of the locality. I believe strongly that this proposal is to the detriment of the appearance of the locality and I agree with Councillor Hudson that this is a materially inappropriate development both by dint of overdevelopment of the site and of being out of keeping with adjacent properties and the area in general. Material points to consider. Is this proposal sympathetic to the local character and history? It is not. Good design. We've heard a lot about the design. Whilst this may be subjective, a three-storey building is not a good design for this area. And whilst the Essex County Council Urban Design Team may consider this acceptable, they also accept that it is not in keeping with the immediate surroundings in the officer's report. 
We would also remember that as a council, we have not adopted the Essex County Council urban design, and this guide should not be afforded much, if any, weight. We can ignore it. Again, on a small but concerning point, the officer report points out that one flat has insufficient storage and proposes a condition to correct this. Yet as members, we have always been advised that we must judge the plans as presented and cannot propose alterations. On this point alone, the application should fail. Similarly, the outdoor space seems to be inadequate as the report states that the residents should have access to a minimum of 25 metres per square metres per flat. That's 200 square metres. We have 40. Yet at least one flat has as stated as only four metres when the minimum is five and it is accepted that some of the outside terraces provided would not afford an acceptable degree of privacy and would be exceptionally noisy. I have tried to contact the officer to get clarification on this but have been unsuccessful. Um, our own DMP states that dormers must be pitched. It is our policy Indeed, in a recent planning appeal, which was dismissed, the inspector referred to that policy, and yet here we have a proposal that purports to be of good design, but incorporates flat roof dormers against our own policy and is recommended for approval. How wrong is that? I'm asked members to consider this application carefully and to refuse it on the following grounds. The unacceptable level of parking provisions, as quoted by Councillor Hudson and in the report. Inadequate storage in one flat. High density in relation to the surrounding area. Inadequate usable private outside space. Flat dormers, contrary to our DMP. Three-storey design not in keeping with the immediate surroundings. Out of keeping with adjacent properties and the area in general, an unacceptable bulk and mass, basically inappropriate for the area. The proposed development would be to the detriment to the character of the immediate locality and represents a materially inappropriate overdevelopment of the site. And I ask you members to seriously consider refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just knock the mic off, please? Are you going, or do you want calling back afterwards for the last? Are there any other non members wanting to speak on this one? No? Okay, we'll start with Councillor Stanley, please, first. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I've heard the comments and um, some of those of what I was going to bring up as well. Um, a, a word to the officers. Um, why do we have planning policies when we decide that this is... That, that, that's a generic question. Yeah, we, sorry. We, again, what I'm trying... Okay, so I'll put it another way. I'll put it another way then. I'll put it another way. Having looked at the... the uh, dimensions that are on the on the plan at the moment um, and that uh, we have a policy of flat roofs and size of parking and that sort of thing um, I did notice that the cars were uh, it, it, the reverse of the cars was on the window side uh, which um, could be a little bit exasperating for those people that have, were in that room uh, if they've got the window open, which um, is not very nice. Um, and also, is the disabled parking bay any larger than the 2.450 parking bay that's on the drawing? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor yeah, Reeves. <coughs> thank you, Chair. I'd just like to say a, uh, a thank, big thank you to the uh, non-members attending for their contribution. Uh, it's one of the things that I think bears repeating that um, Councillor Hudson in particular brought up. In H1, the uh, re 
uh, the officer's report says that we, we meet H1, but uh, I, with, uh, uh, without trying to bore you, if I just read the paragraph from there again, because I need, think it needs underlining. In order to protect the character of existing settlements, the Council will resist the intensification of smaller sites within residential areas. Limited infilling will be considered acceptable, and I note the point there that it says limited, and will continue con to contribute towards housing supply provided it relates well to the existing street pattern, density and character of the locality. Now anyone who actually knows this particular area there will know that uh, Great Eastern Road in particular, the bulk and mass of what is actually proposed here is far in excess of any building in that road. So there on that point, I would like to actually uh, uh, propose that we actually um, refuse this application. Also the parking, uh, this obviously has been demonstrated um, by previous speakers, but one of the things that comes to mind in particular, the actual size of the bays that are proposed for this uh, development, they are minimum. And if you look at the, the, the place of the parking in there, there are, I think it's about uh, four that you can drive straight into. The other ones in the undercroft and uh, then running alongside the boundary, you would have to turn hard into those. Now, because they are minimum, the likelihood of damage there is high. And I think a minimum standard is inappropriate, whatever you think about the quantity of parking there. Um, I've had a number of uh, uh, residents who've actually contacted me uh, about this site. One of the things that I think is concerning, if you realise some of the history, when this was first proposed, I had a, a chat with the planning officer who gave line permission at the time, and his supplication was that it actually was part of the centre of Hockley. Now, anyone who knows Hockley knows that this particular site is not actually what we would consider to be the centre of Hockley. So, therefore, the original line, plan, uh, line permission that was given was flawed. Unfortunately, so much has sprung from that, and that is why this has actually gone as far as it has. But the, the bottom line is to, for us to stand a chance of uh, being able to substantiate a refusal here, I would like to propose that it would be on the grounds of uh, bulk and mass being inappropriate for the area and insufficient parking. Thank you, Chair. Is there any Okay, Council. Um, yes, I, I, I listened to the uh, compelling uh, points that ca Councillor Hudson uh, put, um, and like, like yourself, to me, they... Uh, they, they crystallised around the the gross overdevelopment of the site and the bulk of the building being out of keeping with the properties in the uh, in the general area. I did also particularly note the comment from uh, Councillor Mason about the building line being considerably forward of the the, the properties on both South End Road uh, and Great Eastern Road, so uh, enhancing its uh, its dominance on, on the site. And then we we have the the argument about the compliance with parking standards. This clearly doesn't comply with our parking standards, but it's the weight we give to the officer's uh, view that um, there's mitigation by the fact that other uh, other methods of transport are available, and you can't deny there is a bus bus stop directly outside. But nevertheless, um, it, it's it's in a, an urban location where where ve vehicle transport is used extensively. They are two bedroom flats. Families being in the flats, visitors are going to be common. And I, I, I don't think the officer's interpretation of the 12 parking spaces has been adequate. Remember, it is 12 parking spaces rather than the 14 that are stated in the report. <coughs> it is sufficient. So on, on those three grounds, um, I, I, I agree with you. And uh, as has been uh, seconded by Councillor Weston. Councillor Steptoe. Yes, Chairman. Um, with the uh, proposal and the seconder's uh, permission, I would suggest that they need to add a couple of other things to the uh, uh, refusal. One is with regards to the dormer windows not meeting policy and should be pitched roofs, not flat roofs. 
and secondly that the building mm. is out of line it doesn't comply with the building line uh, I'd hate this to come back to us without those two considerations taken into account yeah that's acceptable right members I think uh, we've we've made quite good progress Do you, would you like to say something before we go to a vote um, only that um, there was one point raised about the disabled bay um, as a matter of point, but the, the, the one disabled bay that's shown is, is larger, so it does have this extra space to enable a disabled person to get into and out of the vehicle more readily. Um, if we are voting, I would like clarity on what the reasons for refusal um, are. Do you want to restate or I, I can I can if you like restate you, what I you, think. You they you are. restate the interpretation. Um, so I think the reasons for refusal that we've got are to do with the scale being inappropriate regarding the bulk and mass that would be um, the sort of the width, the depth and the height of the building. Mm -hmm. um, inappropriate for the locality out of keeping um, with the area. Um, have we got within that also, the building line, the issue of the the building being yeah. forward of the building line and enhancing that dominance of the... Yeah. yeah. Um, and then a, s a separate reason for refusal regarding parking, inadequate parking, insufficient, um, relating to um, the number of spaces, 12, the size of the bays, yeah. etc., or awkwardness of the site, yeah. um, all rolled into that. They're the two reasons for refusal and, that and, I've and got. And the dorma. Could I make a point on the dormer? Please do. Um, so in relation to the dormers, um, I, I, I could get the Google Street image up um, because actually, uh, if, if we can, um, I don't know if we can get it up because I haven't got it loaded, but the, there's a couple of um, fairly recent applications on 47, I think it was 47 or 49 um, South End Road. It's a flattered scheme. They do have modest pitch roof dormers on them. Um, so I'd be nervous about a reason for refusal broadly about flat roof <coughs> dormers um, because some of the dormers that are proposed on this building are modest. If I can take you back to the elevation. Um, so these two, for instance, these little ones here. Um, so if there was a reason for refusal around this, I'd just like some clarity because these two are modest and are very similar in size to the two on number 49 or it might be 47 South End Road. If we're talking about this element of it as a design feature um, and it's then shown here as well, um, that is a more significant sort of flat roof dormer addition and it, th there is a view to be had about whether that's um, an appropriate feature to the building. Um, okay. I just some we'll, clarity. We'll, ju we'll just seek clarity on that from you, Councillor Steptoe. Put that forward. Perhaps with the officer's advice there, we should make it an informative rather than a reason for a refusal. Okay. Okay, so members, we have the interpreted reasons for refusals, an informative regarding the DORMA. Is everyone clear on, on the, those reasons? Okay, so those members in favour of the refusal put forward by Councillor Eaves, seconded by Councillor Weston, please indicate. That item is refused. Thank you very much. Right, members, uh, we're just finding Mrs. Mason's coming back in. Um, this one is New Buildings Farm, Muckingcorn Road, Barling Magna. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in going through what's, what's coming forward in this item, um, there are some really quite technical items to consider. So can I please... Just remind you, as you always do, to pay real attention to what's been said. Don't get distracted, because you're going to need to concentrate to be able to follow with clarity what we're talking about here. Mr Evans, I think you're off. That's...
Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, members. I'll try and go through this as uh, quickly as possible, but there are some technical issues that I need to go through. Right, okay. The application, it's important to clarify um, within this application. You note from the officer's report that proposal is to refurbish, refurbish an original outbuilding as storage for a residential property. I would like to clarify essentially that the application site, the current site is the site of a, of a derelict structure. So the site basically contains the remnants of a former agricultural building established to be abandoned pre-1987. That was a lawful position that was established in previous appeal decisions on previous applications. So in terms of um, the planning application also con confirms the current use as being vacant. So the application then is for basically a new building within the green belt and a material change of use based on the vacancy of the land which is recognised within the planning application. So we'll just go and highlight where the site is. So this is New Hall Farm. We have a building here which was subject to an approval under planning reference 15003344 full, which was a conversion of agricultural building into um, a residential use. So in terms of orientation, we've got Mucking, sorry, mm, yes, Mucking Hall Road is, the, is this road here. So in terms of orientation, we're looking north in this direction. So the actual application site, although there is a wide banded red area as we look at the site plan, which is the next frame, the actual build, the former structure, the derelict structure is in this area here. Just to clarify then that um, there is an extant planning permission for um, carports here. What can be established historically that it was a dairy farm at some point, um, and as members will note from the site history cited in the report, there's quite an extensive site history here. Can we move on to the second slide, please? Or, or two, please. Okay. Yeah, so, as members will note, so in terms of the, the actual site is actually here then, and this is basically this square area here denotes the footprint of this derelict structure, and it also notes a, a concrete padded area which is to the south of the structure. So they just explain this red lined area then, in terms of how it's been defined. What's, I'm just going to go through this again, in terms of the site, we are dealing primarily with this area in here, this shaded grey area. The red lined boundary is basically denotes a, the, the site areas defined by a previous application, which is for this conversion here. So essentially, although we're not debating the red line, the actual planning application involves this specific area of land here, which its, its use is vacant. And I'd just like to say then, that the current lawful position with regards to the application site, it's former agricultural land, which by virtue of the abandonment of an agricultural use is vacant, and neither enjoys the benefit, you, benefit of use as agricultural land, whilst not being affiliated in any way with the residential use, which is granted under 150334. But what we can factually indicate is that, yes, this former agricultural building deemed to be abandoned pre-1987 is within the curtilage of what used to be a, a farm which was a previous use of the site. So in terms of its affiliation it is recognised in previous appeal decisions that at some point before its physical dereliction and decay that it did form part of a wider farmyard setup at uh, New Hall, New Buildings Farm. So we'll go to the existing plan, 003, please. So what we have here is a shot looking, the first slide at the top is a shot looking at the north elevation, at the rear elevation. So this depicts basically looking 
into the site from the north. And what this denotes is is the this is the gable, the north gable elevation of the band conversion which has taken place. And then this is the rear wall of what remains of a no, I, I can't produce any better than that, really. Yeah, on the top one, if you can. Is that, is that better, members? If you can scroll across a bit. I was just pointing. So, so this is the rear elevation of the what remains of the, of the former structure. So this elevation here is the north elevation of an area of wall which remains, which is the only remnants of a larger cow house, which basically occupies that area of land between the this structure here and the ban conversion. This shot here is basically depicts the, the current elevation at the south elevation of this site. Uh, members will appreciate from the plan I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes in terms of areas highlighted. So currently, I'll explain that this is currently what we have but I wish to explain that the existing plan showing what remains of the remnant structure is n so not all of which you see is authorised development. This will be clarified further by the shaded highlighted plan. So what we have here is it's self-explanatory really but the south elevation you can see basically in terms of the eaves height here you have what remains of the former wall plate here, which is built to a certain level. Um, there's an RSJ steel uh, beam in here, and there are, there are sections of wall which at some point have been rebuilt. That is clarified further within the lawful development certificate that was applied for, and I'll discuss that in a second, and also is clarified in terms of the background to the building of a couple of sections of wall one of which this section here and i will show members photographs is a sort of a standalone stone pier so basically what i'm trying to explain to members is is that the existing plan is not the same as actually what the the derelict structure was um at the time it was deemed to be abandoned there's been works that have been undertaken to the building which are unauthorized so whether members consider that, that it's a building now. The lawful position is that it's not a building at all. It's a remnant of a former agricultural <coughs> building. If we can just go down to the proposed plan, which are the two slides at the bottom of this current plan. If we can scroll up. Can you just scroll up so we can see the remaining sections? Yes. So what we have in it then is the proposed basically to, to build up the, the wall plate level. So this is the, the rear aspect. So it's basically to get the building physically from this state, this is the rear elevation currently to that basically, which would involve the slightly building up of the wall plate levels. Just bear with me. Yeah, so phys physically adding on to the building structure and um, the paragraph three of my report indicates significant rebuilding works and the application involves um, obviously the, the change of use as well. So basically the finish, the desired end product basically is bricking up those areas which would need to be built up to create this pitched roof, this opening remains, and then in terms of the arrangement at the front, there's one slide at the bottom, isn't there, of this current slide, so I can show the south elevation. If you scroll down to the bottom of the current slide. So, yes, thank you. So what this depicts is, is the carport which has been approved under planning reference um, 1600556. So it's a, it's a plan that shows how the, it's, it's proposed that the, the site will emerge. So essentially what the application is, is to say, is to ask this site that was lastly established as an agricultural use, it's, it's a name to use this building to bring this well former structure a derelict structure back into use to reinstate the land but not as an agricultural use perhaps the word isn't reinstate is to use it for um, as part of the larger residential curtilage um, of the property okay thank you for that we shall now go on to slide 004 
Come as a zero zero five. That's the same zero zero five. That'll be fine. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now, members, is to show you some photographs, which is almost like a um, a check-in time of how th things have emerged um, over time with this building. So what we can establish is is that what this photograph shows is the 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 steel RSJ has gone in here and basically some timber work have gone in. So this was taken in to th on, the ten of the, on the 6th of October 2009. So in terms of the intention there, I think what all we can sort of comment on here is, is that at that time, the authority were made aware of some work, of works that were taking place to the building. Um, so okay, if we can move on to, there's a few slides within this same, within this page, if you like, if you scroll down the page, there's a number of photographs. If you, you can just go down the arrow on the side and there's a number of photographs. So there we are, that's a, a, a good picture. So that basically is the front elevation of the property, of the, of the land and, and the structure as it was on the 6th of October. So clearly there were intentions to make some use of this building. Um, and you can see really in terms of the physical state, the fabric of the building at that time. And I think there are further photographs within this shot as well. That one's not so relevant. But if we can go down, scroll through them all. Okay, that's uh, okay, and that's that's fine. But right, that's uh, quite a telling photograph. So that image there, just to clarify, that this would be a view of the building from the east, basically. So you're looking from, this is where the permission has been granted for the, the carport. And you can see in terms of what remains of the building. And I'm going to move on now to the next slide. Yeah, yeah the next, or oh, is it oh, 06 now, is it? Or oh, 07, just yeah, that's like all seven, please. Yeah, just go through the, yeah, that, the, that one, yeah, that's fine. So again, this is an image. This is where there was a former long cow house. So this again, this image is dated on, by now, on the 30th of the 4th, 2014. And I will fill in the gaps in terms of what happened, in terms of any, of any, any interest that the authority took in this work between 2000 and between the last shots. If we can just have a, another scroll down through these photographs, that's not so relevant. Uh, okay, so we can go on to the next one then, please. Yeah, that's very important, right. Okay, the, what is significant here is, is that on the 10th of ascent 2017, when these photographs were taken, there is a material change in, the, in this derelict structure in that physical works have been uh, uh, undertaken to basically try, try, to try and reinst reinstate some of the fabric of this building. And this section here in particular was not there back in 2000 and sort of in the earlier photographs. So there's, there's a, an effort to, to do something to the building as to bring it back into some kind of use. Um, if we can go through those slides, please. There we go. That's a, a good image. So, so that is an image looking from the south, effectively, at the other elevation of the building. So I just wanted members to be clear about the, the state of the building as it was on the 10th of the 7th, 2017. And if you can move through the pictures, please. And that's another one. So that is the rear elevation of the building. And this is the, the conversion here. So members can appreciate what the physical state is. Perhaps we'll move on to the next slide now, please. The next full slide. Yeah, please. I'm showing you these photos, so they are quite relevant to what we have to consider. So I apologize if you feel it's a bit onerous, but I feel I do have to do that. Can. And what I would say is, is that there is a plan, a shaded plan here somewhere. Do you see a highlighted yeah. shaded? Can we go to the shaded plan, perhaps? That's quite useful. That's essential that we bring that shaded plan up if we can. Yeah, that's quite useful. So members have seen the building in terms of the photographs. So th I think this shaded plan is quite useful. Now, <coughs> basically, just explain to members. So 
you'll note that I've referred to this structure as a derelict <coughs> former agricultural building that's now vacant. Now, what happened um, in terms of the physical works, you saw the steel RSJ uh, steel beam that had gone in, the, the timber work that had, that had taken place, the um, building of that steel, of that brick pier on the left-hand side. Now, what happened was is that basically um, an application for lawful development certificate was, was submitted uh, which was 1300143, dated on the 11th of March 2013. It was refused on the 10th of May, um, on the 10th of May of that year. And that application for lawful development certificate was the, the title of that lawful development certificate application was Reinstatement of Original Building and Use of Adjoining Land in Association with It. This appeal was dismissed on the 22nd of April 2014. This was considered at the same time as an appeal against an enforcement notice served in September the 18th, 2013. And basically the enforcement notice, I have a copy of it here, and basically the enforcement notice was, was issued um, and this was the, 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 the sort of the subject matter of what the enforcement notice was seeking to rectify. Work's been undertaken to this building on the 23rd of September 2009, so there was a quite a gap between serving the enforcement notice and the actual, when the, the works first took place. So we noted that works in terms of the RSJ, et cetera, would have been noted in 2009, but it, it was back in, but it was in 2013 <coughs> when the enforcement no notice um, was issued, but that was because the applicant had had the opportunity and the right, to be fair, to submit a lawful development certificate to prove as a matter of law that the works that were being undertaken to the building were lawful in connection with works to an agricultural building under permitted development rights. So, the, so but what happened was that once the, the lawful development certificate was actually refused in 2013, which clarified the lawful position. And what that lawful development certificate appeal decision clarified, that the building was no longer an agricultural building. Its use had been abandoned. That had been prior to 1987. That then, in terms of expediency and the actual facts of the case that were established by the council in its decision on the lawful development certificate application, and as underpinned by the, the inspector's decision on the lawful development certificate, an enforcement notice was served. The events that took place then was that the ap applicant appealed the decision of the lawful development certificate. The applicant then appealed the subject matter of the enforcement notice, and the enforcement notice was served, therefore, in relation to these works. Insertion of an RSJ steel beam and roof timbers to facilitate the, action of the erection of a flat roof. The owner, the owner was warned the works were unlawful and was advised to stop any further works. Further works continued. The laying of a concrete floor and construction of a roof in 2011, the insertion of a stud wall to the front finished in wood cladding and the erection of wooden doors to the front of the building between May 2011 and November 2011. The exterior brick walls have been extended to the north and west elevations, including the rebuilding of the two front corner sections between January 2012 and April 2012. So that actual, the, the appeal against the lawful development certificate refusal and the appeal against the enforcement notice were dealt with by, by means of appeal A and appeal B, and they were considered together in a conjoined appeal decision basically and both appeals were um, dismissed and that basically was definitive in actually clarifying the lawfulness of those works which were subject of the enforcement notice that they weren't lawful under agricultural use its agricultural use had been abandoned and that the that could not be demonstrated that the site lo was any longer used for agricultural purposes. Therefore, the works to the former agricultural building could not have been lawful. 
and the enforcement notice, basically, there's a parity between the Lawful Development Certificate uh, Appeal decision and the enforcement notice, which conclude, basically, that the, that the development is, constitutes inappropriate development within the Green Belt. Um, beca because, basically, in terms of the pictures that members saw, that, and as the building stands now, there is a, there is a difference between what actually you see as a structure and your interpretation of that, whether you see it as a building, it's a structure with further works being undertaken to make it perhaps more feasible that it could be conceived as a building, but there's a very clear inspector's decision, it's not a building, the works to try and reinstate it as a building are unlawful, both lawful the one it and appeal, the enforcement appeal were dismissed. So in terms of, I think that's important, and I just want to, just to clarify to members before I sort of move on to the closing uh, uh, section, is what this, it's important to sort of try and clarify, what this diagram shows is these grey areas are clearly the remnants of a former structure. The yellow works depict what works have been undertaken, which are the works undertaken which are the subject of the enforcement notice. So the yellow sections are the unauthorised works which the, the Lawful Development Certificate Appeal deemed were unlawful, therefore we could not grant a certificate and the appeal was dismissed. So what we've got is, is, is raising the, the um, wall plate levels here and then these brick piers on either side. Now this brick pier here um, is actually detached from the main building. So, and then the green section depicts really what this application therefore aims to complete, if you like. So the yellow works are unauthorised, the green works are what this application seeks to, um, to achieve, but also by virtue of this planning application, it's also seeking to regularise the unauthorised works highlighted in yellow that is a subject of the... Of the um, the dismissed uh, enforcement notice. So it is quite complicated, but I, I have to explain that to members. So in terms of moving on, paragraph 11 of the report covers the key issues. The key issue is, is that there is a fundamental flaw in the planning application, as I, I consider it. It's not refurbishment. Because of the degree of unauthorised works and the degree of works required to make it a building, the Basically, in Greenbelt terms, because of the, the previous appeal decisions, the previous decisions that have been reached by the authority, this clearly is a new building in the open countryside because it's, it's a derelict structure. We're not talking about expanding on an existing building, extensions to a building. It's a new building and a vacant plot which has lost its agricultural use in the open countryside. So I want members to be very clear about that. Paragraph 14 of the report, the key point in paragraph 14 of the report is there's no fundamental difference between this, this current application, however which way it's worded, and what the council refused under 17.00858, which is refused on, on the, in 2017. Okay. So the key issue is that policy has not changed. New buildings are inappropriate developments in the Green Belt. And those exceptions, and the, the exceptions are cited in paragraph 145 of the National Planning Policy Framework. The, the, in terms of inappropriate development, the default position is that, that if it's inappropriate development and it doesn't form and fall under the one, except, one of the exceptions of paragraph 145 of the MPPF, the default position is that by reason of inappropriateness it's harmful to the Green Belt. We do have to give substantial weight to this harm. Yes, we do have to look at that, therefore, the very special circumstances, which obviously policy advisors will not exist unless this harm by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm is clearly outweighed by other considerations. So I've reminded members about previous decisions, including the latter 17.00858, and that one, just to remind members, was to demolish and reconstruct original outbuilding to be used as storage. So there is no difference between this current application and the one refused there in terms of effect or, or actually its, its, its residual impacts. 
one to go on. So in terms of the very speci special circumstances, I do want to refer to paragraph 20 to 23 of the report, because we do have to consider this, that the, in the covering statement submitted by the applicant, and there's the supporting statement from um, Mr. Dag, barrister, and in terms of the very special circumstances, I've, I've just picked this out, that it's very relevant. In the applicant's uh, case, it says that a new chapter has begun in terms of, the, of, the, of this site because of the, there we go, in terms of, let me have a look at this. <coughs> Yes, that it says, doesn't it, in paragraph 20, that it's asserted that a new chapter in the planning history of the site has begun. However, the site, um, because of the previous permissions granted in 2015 and 2016. Now, what we have to remember, what I reminded members of is, is that this application site has no affiliation with the residential curtilage of the application approved um, under the... Under the um, 150334, the, the proposed change of use. It did show a very large curtilage. However, officers were diligent in, in the granting of planning permission for the band conversion. It was very clear that it didn't include where that building was. That was still vacant land. It was very clear that it included a hatched area on the plan that made it very clear that the residential curtilage did not include that area of land where the barn was. And basically, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that in terms of what could be, to be fair, of a special, very special circumstance, the authority would not agree with the points made within the planning justification that a new chapter has begun because there have been new permissions for the car port also. <laughs> But that does not include the land subject of this application. Therefore, a new chapter in the history of the site, as in as it relates to this specific footprint of this building, has not begun. It cannot therefore serve as the very special circumstance to outweigh the provisions of policy. So just to conclude, members, the application is fundamentally flawed given the material facts. The statement seeks to justify development on the basis of buildings as being on an existing agriculture, sorry, yeah, the statement seeks to justify development on the basis of the building being an existing agricultural building, which is stated in, this, in the actual statement. It's not an existing agricultural building. And the acceptance of a distinctly separate parcel of land in connection with a separate residential use. So, in conclusion, the site of the building is not, does not enjoy an established residential use. The point raised within the supporting statement which seek to perpetuate the case for allowing this development cannot be given any consideration or weight on the basis of the factual incorrectness of the statement. The site is also, the other point that was made was that the site is only vi visible from within the courtyard as the statement asserts. That is not the case. I showed members pictures before of the site on the approach along um, Mucking Hall Road. The site is not only just visible within the courtyard. Now, the significance of this point is, is that in terms of greenbelt openness, although it's not the only consideration, visual impact is part of the consideration of impact upon greenbelt openness. Therefore, there are the, the actual statements are factually incorrect, and I just want members to to be certain that the site is not just only visible within a courtyard area, they're visible from long range views from the south as you're approaching the site, which has a fundamental impact on green belt openness. So it is an appropriate development. It's a new building in the green belt, which would contradict the previous decisions we've made in relation to what is in effect the same development, although word is slightly different, and it would undermine previous appeal decisions and our, the previous position that we've taken. Therefore, it's my recommendation, Chair, that the application be refused. Thank you. We've got a speaker now, Councillor Stepdrop, so it's Mr. Dagg. Thank you, Chairman, members. Uh, thank you, members, for inspecting the site and the surroundings on the 28th of May. You'll not be surprised to hear that uh, 
we take a rather different view from that that's been expressed by Mr. Owell Evans, but I'm not going to try and pick holes in his report. I'm going to go through three points for you, which I hope will clarify and simplify the situation, because there is a danger here in overcomplicating what is, in fact, in essence, not a very complicated situation. The context is, as you have seen on site, that this, uh, this site is part of a small cluster of buildings in the Green Belt, including New Buildings Farm Cottages and Bannister House, which are occupied residences. A New Buildings Farm was originally a 19th century cattle farm, that's all agreed. Buildings survived, it's not in dispute that the agricultural use went, uh, and there isn't an extant agricultural use. The buildings, importantly, as you will have seen on site, are linked by a tall 2.8 meter high original wall on their northern side that links together everything. It links together what was permitted in 2015, planning permission granted to convert the westernmost building into a single story house, and in 2016 a four bay carport was permitted backing onto the wall. You've, you've seen all of that. It's the uh, westernmost um, part of the surviving structure with which uh, we're concerned. And the present proposal is to utilize the remaining brickwork of the eastern building to form a domestic store. I agree that you have to ignore the unauthorized work that was carried out after 2009, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still a substantial amount of work remaining. That's our point. Original brickwork survives to between 3.5 and 4 meters, the plan, the footprint of the original, will not be exceeded. It's a key point that, as a matter of law, the existing structure is clearly a building. Anything that has been said to the contrary is wrong as a matter of law. Section 3361 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, the basic statute, a building includes any structure or erection and any part of a building. Nothing in your development plan, nothing in the NPPF contradicts that. Going to planning policy, as you all know, Greenbelt policy, of course, is very protective of the purposes of the Greenbelt and the openness of the Greenbelt. But some built development is regarded as acceptable, i.e. not inappropriate. See paragraph 145C of the NPPF. The extension or alteration of a building, this is a building, providing that it does not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the original building, that's the case here. Given the extent of the surviving original brick structure, the additional brickwork and the roof to match the roofs of the other buildings which have been permitted in 2015 and 2016 will be proportionate. And the key point is that you can see that comparing the existing, the lawful existing, the pre-2009 existing with what's proposed, there will not be harm to openness, nor will there be encroachment of built form onto the green belt. There will, in fact, be a significant improvement in appearance. Look at paragraph 141 of the NPPF. It encourages a positive approach. It says that authorities should look for opportunities to enhance visual amenity or to improve damaged and derelict land. Third point. Had there been likely green belt harm, it would, one have uh, expected, uh, have been the position of the parish council and local residents that there would have been objections to the proposal. But in fact, when you look at the responses which are in paragraphs 24 and 26 of the case officer's report, there is no suggestion of objection, in fact, quite to the contrary. Barling Parish Council commends the application for approval to bring back into productive use a derelict and unattractive building, and the other neighbours' comments were similarly very supportive. And I would suggest that very considerable weight ought to be given to these reasonable and practical observations. The key point is that one should compare what is there now, what is lawfully there now. I take, of course, Mr. Arnold Evans' points about the unauthorised <laughs> work carried out. Uh, after 2009, but compare what is lawfully there now with what is proposed against the background, the context of what was permitted by this authority in 2015 and 2016. That created a new planning situation. That is the opening of the new planning chapter from 2015, 2016. It is not necessary to plow through what happened historically before that Go date. Ahead. What is now there is what you have to focus on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any of our non-members wish to contribute? OK. 
Councillor Steptoe. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Just before I start, I'd like to clarify a couple of points um, from the uh, officer's uh, presentation. Firstly, a couple of the photographs he showed, he misled us by saying that they were the uh, eastern side where the open door is. That's actually the western side. And the side that you can see there now, sort of going off to the right, that is the eastern side. You'll look, the wooden bit in the middle is actually the southern side. So just to clarify that. Also as well, with regards to the plan, where you've got the different colours uh, that you had up, can I ask officers in future to not use those particular colours? Uh, I'm having extreme difficulty to distinguish between them having been red, green, colour blind. So the green part of that is not easy for me to distinguish. Right, Chairman, just to clarify for uh, members, it's known as New Buildings Farm, and as our speaker has mentioned, it was actually built in the 19th, early 20th century, and it's how the name sticks. It was New Farm at the time, and it is now stuck. The building was originally, when I've spoken to some of the older, older residents of the area, was actually the dairy of the cattle farm, um, and, that was, uh, and many of them remember it being in use. Uh, it was left derelict, but it was vi um, eventually destroyed by the hurricane in the late 80s. That's how it arrived in the state that it is now. <coughs> With regards to the actual building itself uh, that is there, I would suggest that there is more of the walls and the building that are surviving than actually would need to be replaced. Um, there's the roof itself. And obviously what you can see, and I think I'm right in saying that the bit on the lower there to the uh, left of, as I'm looking at the photograph there, the frontage, that's in green, is it? Just to clarify, that's one of the green bits you were talking about. I'm having trouble mm -hmm. seeing it. Yeah. It's that bit that's missing. So basically all that you're going to be replacing is tidying up some of the brickwork around the eaves height and the gable end mm -hmm. and reinstating the frontage and the roof. I would suggest that there's more of the building existing than that that would need to be replaced. It would be interesting to note that if if the building was not touched and it was left as it is with, with the bits removed that are unauthorised, if the property owners wanted to have some storage, it would be quite conceivable that they could come forward and put a large wooden building on the site, not necessarily with planning permission, or a container or something to that sort of end. So I would suggest that it's far better to bring this building back into use than to actually go to that particular particular way. So I would like to propose, Chairman, that we accept the application on the basis that it isn't detrimental to the openness of the green belt because the basic structure is already in place. But I would add to that that I would like to see any further permitted development to be removed. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Reeves. Thank you, Chair. It's very uh, useful to have gone to the site to actually had a look at it. Um, I understand where the officer has actually uh, laboured the point of the um, uh, judgment that was brought on the, uh, uh, the, the uh, unauthorised works. I wonder if uh, we're in this situation basically because that, um, that order is in place, um, that that is why we cannot actually, or you're recommending refusal. Uh, I'd like clarif clarification on that because it, it strikes me that if we actually made a condition that you actually took down the works, however good they may be, of what was done or unauthorised and then returned, because then that would take out the contention of uh, building on something which has previously been um, uh, judged to be unauthorised and then come back to uh, propose the full building works as is. Because I, I, although it sounds a little convoluted, it then does take the problem out of it where we uh, do ha stand the chance of being um, having levelled to us that we are allowing something which has previously been judged against. 
It seems like that might be a pragmatic approach to it. I'd like a little bit of clarification on that, please. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I just need to comment, comment there. I quite understand where you're coming from, but it's not for the officers to foresee, or even, or which might be perceived as advice, as to as to a way forward to get a planning application. We 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 absolutely can't do that. We we must determine on the application that's in front of us. Okay, can I ask the clarification then? Is the clar uh, could you clarify then that the reason being why you are recommending refusal is purely and simply because there has been a um, uh, a judgment on works that has been done? Quite clearly, no, it isn't. It's basically as there has been a lawful decision. We heard the speaker what he said. There's been a lawful decision on the lawful status of the site within this appeal decision. It is not a building. By reason of the yellow works have been undertaken, it's unlawful. But in terms of if you put aside the enforcement notice, given that the material facts of the lawfulness is, is this site hasn't got a use and it's not a building. Therefore, it's a new building in the green belt. The default position is new buildings in the green belt are inappropriate. And therefore, the default position is, regardless of this, my recommendation would still be that the application be refused. So the pragmatic approach you um, cite is not really relevant. Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, that was just one of the clarifications that I would like. There was that um, this would actually be, uh, because it, it, in its past tense, it, it is now in, in reality, if you like, is that the building is not there, and and this is a complete new building, even though some of it is using the old bricks or whatever the case may be. Um, and the other thing that uh, really uh, um, is it only for general use and not for residential use. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Do you want to? Come in now. Thank you, Chairman. Having visited this site, I can I cannot see in any way how this would be in detriment to this site, and I would like to second Councillor Steptoe's proposal. Okay. Did you want to just answer that? Question? Yeah, there was one question, wasn't there, from Councillor Stanley about is it for residential use? Yeah, there's an inference that it's to be used in connection with the ban conversion granted uh, previous permission. So it's, it's an extension of that area, including the carport area. So it's that. Ex so just to clarify and to come back to what um, Councillor Stepton was saying is in terms of it's to the east aspect of the existing bu building. Yeah. I have to take on this occasion some sympathy with the officers. Clearly, if you came to this application cold, then you pr I doubt you'd see much of a problem. But the officers have got their interpretation, and at times we do take a slightly different view of their interpretation. But on this occasion, their interpretation has been tested by an inspector. So there isn't any bending, there isn't any further interpretation that, that they have the ability to do. Their, their, their view is quite definitive. And if we were to take the uh, approval that's been put forward by, by Councillor Steptoe uh, uh, and accept that, we would need to have, I believe, exceptionally clear and exceptional circumstances to do that because we are overruling not only our own previous decisions, but a decision that has been tested by an inspector. Um, certainly, the argument about the new chapter has been made but again, the officers are, are quite clear and were quite clear at the time that the carport went up that that didn't describe a new chapter. So we've got a, a point of disagreement there. Maybe there's 
some interpretation over that one. But this is this is very challenging, and um, we've we've got a motion that we're we're going to be taking to to to, to vote for um, for approval before before too long. But on on this occasion, we must be absolutely clear that there is no uh, there is no interpretation of the officer's judgment the officer's judgment is definitive in it and it's tested and the quality of our decision is a risk that we we take on ourselves councillor cutmore there we go uh thank you chairman uh, just to uh, I, I too have sympathy I, I understand where our members are coming from on this and i understand the local neighbors as well relating to a very uh, poor building, if you like, that uh, we're looking at there and the, the state of the site. Uh, and in relation to the work that's been done, which we have to ignore in planning terms, uh, so we're looking at the basic building that was originally there, and we've already had a planning inspector rule that it is not a building, and we cannot ignore that either. Um, so I think you're right in as much as you say there has to be very special circumstances were we to allow uh, the development on this site, even though it's not for actual occupation, it's purely for storage. But having said that, surely the, uh, the actual decision will be made by the appropriate minister uh, effectively going forward uh, in, in eventual, uh, you know, as it goes on. Because we can only recommend, I believe, because it is Greenbelt. Am I right in saying that? No. We're making a decision. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Steptoe, would you like to restate, please, your motion for approval? But can I, can I ask you to be as full as you can on the circumstances why you're, you, you're not agreeing or overtur uh, overturning the officer's recommendation and providing the very special circumstances? Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, just before I do that, whether you call it a new build or uh, a not, you've got to acknowledge the fact that there is a substantial structure there in place, uh, whether you consider it to be, um, we can't, you can't take it as being invisible, it is there. Um, and I would like to, as I've said, propose that it is not detrimental to the openness of the green belt, and that it is perfectly acceptable where it is for purely for storage and I would ask that the, um, any permitted development rights are removed for any f future Green development that may come forward for it. Have any just clarify that, that element. Bas basically, just to cover that, in terms of the planning permission that was granted, sorry, so this application would basically bring into a residential use that form of vacant <laughs> agricultural use. So I guess that there's no difference in this application, I suppose, in terms of extending a residential curtilage. So as part of that, there would be an opportunity to ensure that, that what would be effectively Class E development buildings than the curtilage of a dwelling house would, um, you know, you could control um, further works, which, you know, in terms of an insertion of a dorm in the roof, etc. Yeah. I'm right on that, I think, Councillor Katie. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And seconded by Councillor Williams. Right, members, we'll go to the vote. Those members in favour of the approval with the circumstances outlined by uh, Councillor Steptoe, please indicate. Those against? Six. All right. That item is approved. Thank you, members, for one of our longer meetings.